So you want to learn Little Logic, the series, part 4, the invalidity test. In the previous screencast, we introduced a test for invalidity and finished up with a short set of exercises. We'll start here by going through those exercises and then discussing some of the implications of this simple test for invalidity. Here were the exercises. First, the winning ticket is number 500. Bill holds ticket number 501, therefore Bill does not hold the winning ticket. Second, some people smoke cigars, some people smoke pipes, therefore some people smoke cigars and pipes. And third, Anna does not believe there is a cat in a box, therefore Anna believes that there is no cat in the box. Remember the test for invalidity. Imagine first that the premises are true, and second that the conclusion is false, and then third, think up a scenario that might make that possible. All of these examples are cases of invalid arguments. Number one. Imagine that the winning ticket is number 500 and Bill has 501. Also imagine that Bill does in fact hold the winning ticket. A possible explanation would be that Bill holds both tickets. The premise does not, after all, say that Bill holds only ticket number 501. The argument, therefore, is invalid. Number two. Imagine that some people smoke cigars, some pipes, and further, it is not the case that some people smoke cigars and pipes. What could explain this is that we live in a world where cigar smokers avoid pipes and pipe smokers avoid cigars. That is, nobody smokes both cigars and pipes. This makes it so that some people smoke cigars and some pipes, but nobody smokes both. The argument is therefore invalid. Number three. Imagine that Anna does not believe there is a cat in the box, but she also does not believe that there is no cat in the box. This is a little tricky because it requires us to think about the nature of belief. Let's look more closely at this example. When we say you do not believe X, there are at least two possible meanings. The first is that you believe not X. In other words, you would say, I do not believe that Tom is in the corner, if you believe that Tom is not in the corner. That is, you have a belief in not X, Tom is not in the corner which makes it impossible for you to believe X, Tom is in the corner. The second possible meaning, when you say that you do not believe X, is that you simply have no belief one way or the other regarding X. In other words, you would say, I do not believe that Tom is in the corner, if you meant that you did not hold a belief that Tom is in the corner. It isn't that you believe Tom is not in the corner, rather, you simply have no belief state regarding Tom being in the corner one way or the other. Another way you can think about it is this. It is probably reasonable to say that you do not believe that I am six feet tall. This is because I have never talked about my height, so you have no reason to believe that I am six feet tall. It is not that you believe I am not six feet tall. It's that you have no belief one way or the other. So back to our third exercise, which states Anna does not believe there is a cat in the box. We might naturally think that this means Anna believes there is no cat in the box. But this interpretation is not the only possibility, as we've just explained. It could be that Anna simply does not have a belief, one way or the other, about there being a cat in the box. Perhaps she has never even thought about it. Looking at it this way, it would be possible for Anna not to believe there is a cat in the box, and also for Anna not to believe that there is no cat in the box. Therefore, the argument is invalid. The Implications for Invalidity the test for invalidity is a quick device that we apply to natural language arguments, and in our case, that natural language is English. One of the great advantages of the test is that it gives us some insight into why invalid arguments are invalid. But there are limitations to the test. First, it only tells us when an argument is invalid, not when an argument is valid. If you can't think up a possible situation where the premises are true and the conclusion false, you might assume that the argument is valid. Now you're in a bad spot. Is it really that the argument is valid? Or is it that the argument is invalid, but you just can't come up with a situation that proves its invalidity? Second, the test for invalidity doesn't help us construct valid arguments. It only helps us spot invalid ones. Given these limitations, we have to move beyond the test for invalidity and learn to look at arguments symbolically. We'll explore what that means in the next screencast, to give you a bit of a preview, many natural language arguments that, on the surface, look different from one another, actually share similar forms. 
It is these forms that we draw out when we look at an argument symbolically. Symbolic argument forms are at the core of the study of formal logic, and offers us a very powerful way to look at and evaluate arguments in general. If this sounds intimidating, don't worry. We'll make sense of it when we go through it next time.